By the end of the first millennium, China was the richest civilization on Earth. It was the leader in technological developments and living standards. And it was the inventor of paper, silk, gunpowder, porcelain, and mechanical clocks. When the Venetian explorer Marco Polo visited China some 300 years later, in about 1300, he was astounded by the riches and lavish living of the Chinese monarchs and their administrators. He'd come from a Europe that was backward, poor, rural, agrarian, and illiterate. Yet by the middle of the second millennium, Europe had surpassed China as the most economically developed area of the world. China went, went into a centuries-long period of isolation and decline. This was followed by foreign conquest, occupation, and humiliation. This, this history of oppression by foreign powers plays a large part in contemporary Chinese economic, political, and military policy. Today, China is again a major economic power, but its re-emergence took almost 1,000 years to accomplish. Historically, Chinese emperors based their power and wealth on agriculture. China was a vast area populated by millions of peasants toiling on the lands of distant landlords. The income these plantations produced fed the treasuries of the Chinese imperial class and their bureaucrats and servants. Because the peasants were so numerous and the ruling class was so small, there was little pressure to increase agricultural output or think about technological improvements. Even illiterate peasants working with simple tools could produce more than enough food. This situation was not that different from pre-revolutionary society in Russia. There, a large peasant class worked in the fields of the imperial and religious landlords and had no meaningful incentive to work harder or smarter. The technical marvels of Chinese civilization, the water clocks and gunpowder, were considered interesting and entertaining toys. They were not considered marketable commodities capable of generating profits for further investments. The ruling class of China was bureaucratic and governmental, without the vision to create or expand markets. There was also little interest in the outside world and little or no desire to trade or exchange goods with foreigners. The Chinese rulers considered themselves a superior culture with nothing to gain from interacting with barbaric foreigners. It seems to me that one of the chief economic lessons of history is that isolation leads to stagnation and declining standards of living. Think of ancient China or the Soviet Union and North Korea. The dominant religious or philosophical belief in imperial China was Confucianism. This taught deference to superiors and the maintenance of established social relations. It was hardly a philosophy to encourage innovation and entrepreneurship. Learning under a Confucian code meant memorization of approved texts and disapproval of critical thinking. For most of pre-modern Chinese history, there was an excess supply of labor and a shortage of arable land. The basic laws of demand and supply will tell you that this situation leads to low wages and high rents. Peasant laborers will stay poor and landlords will get rich. This is not a situation that fosters market demand for consumer goods or leads owners to search for labor-saving technology. If labor is cheap, there's no need to try to economize. Paradoxically, one of the main drivers of labor-saving technology in medieval Europe was the coming of the Black Death in the mid-14th century. The plague wiped out hundreds of thousands of workers. This made labor relatively scarce and expensive. Business owners and landlords now had incentives to find ways to economize on labor and this gave strong emphasis to technological development. So things were not so good for workers who got sick and died from the plague, but for those who survived and their descendants, life got better. 
By the middle of the 19th century, the British had developed a taste for Chinese tea and silk. Unfortunately, the Chinese didn't really want anything from the British. The Chinese considered their fabrics and clothing superior to anything that was coming out of the British textile mills. However, and unfortunately for the Chinese, many Chinese got hooked on imported opium from British-ruled India. And the so-called opium wars of the mid-19th century, resulting in new commercial privileges and legal and territorial concessions for Britain, became a further source of humiliation for the Chinese. Over time, the Chinese became less able to protect their citizens from the pushers of debilitating drugs, namely the British Empire. Can you get some idea of why the Chinese today are driven to make their country strong and independent and proud? Further humiliation came in 1894 when the Japanese attacked China and seized the island of Formosa. This island was not returned to China until after World War II and then separated again after the Communist Revolution of 1949. It's known today as Taiwan, or the Republic of China. Two Chinese leaders emerged in the early 20th century who would attempt to drive out foreigners and modernize China. The first was Sun Yat-sen, a medical student and founder of China's nationalist movement. He succeeded at establishing a new government in 1911 that drove out the last imperial rulers of the Qing dynasty, which had reigned since 1644. But Sun's government was not powerful enough to seize lasting power from the nation's landlord class, and so political instability prevailed. And then came Mao Zedong, the son of a peasant who had prospered as a farmer and grain dealer. Mao was a student activist and educator who helped to found the Chinese Communist Party in 1921. Impressed with Marxist theory and the Russian Revolution, Mao saw the same revolutionary potential in China's peasant class. He was invited to Moscow by the new Soviet government and given education and training in communist theory and tactics. Sun Yat-sen died in 1925 and was succeeded by the anti-communist soldier and nationalist Chiang Kai-shek. Now, a civil war broke out between the forces of Mao and those of Chiang Kai-shek. In the early going, the nationalists scored several victories over the communists, who were forced to retreat to a mountain stronghold in northwest China. This long march by Mao's forces was turned into one of the foundation myths of the Chinese Communist Party. The Japanese invaded again in 1931, seizing the province of Manchuria and occupying several coastal cities of China. Japanese soldiers engaged in mass executions and rape that are today considered one of the more horrific crimes against humanity during the 20th century. I've had three different tours as a guest professor at the Chinese University of Petroleum's Academy of Chinese Energy Strategy in Beijing. My accommodations have always included a nice television. The only problem is that my Chinese language skills are non-existent. So I end up watching basketball games and badminton matches. My parents were both champion badminton players. And action movies. Many of the action movies are war stories about Chinese soldiers and civilians fighting Japanese soldiers. Even with no knowledge of Chinese, it's very easy for me to identify the good guys and the bad guys. After the Chinese invaded Manchuria, Mao and Chiang Kai-shek agreed to a temporary truce while they fought to drive out the Japanese. During this period, about 20 million Chinese lost their lives in the fight against the Japanese. Later, when World War II ended and the Japanese were defeated, hostilities broke out again between Mao's communist forces and the nationalist army led by Chiang Kai-shek. By this time, Mao had secured the backing of most of the Chinese peasantry. 
He did so by promising land redistribution from the landlords to the peasants. And since the peasantry was the dominant class in Chinese society, Mao had the majority of the population on his side. This reminds me of something the behavioral economist and U.S. military analyst Daniel Ellsberg said about American involvement in the Vietnam War. Ellsberg was one of the chief authors of a government study of U.S. decision-making in Vietnam, later known as the Pentagon Papers. Ellsberg said, It's hard to win a peasant war when you're fighting on the side of the landlords. There are always a lot more peasants than landlords. And throughout their history, peasants have always wanted one thing, their own land. Whoever promises that will have their support. Vladimir Lenin understood this as he was advocating the cause of the Bolsheviks during the Russian Revolution. The Bolshevik slogan was land, peace, and bread. That is, land for the Russian peasant, peace for the peasants conscripted into the Tsar's army to fight during World War I, and bread for the urban workers. There were very few urban workers in post-World War II China, so Mao needed only to appeal to the peasantry. He defeated the forces of Chiang Kai-shek in 1949, and Chiang fled with the nationalist forces to the island of Formosa. After the People's Republic of China was founded in October 1949, Mao initially kept his promise and redistributed land to more than 300 million peasants. While this was politically popular, it was economically damaging. The peasants' plots were very small, suitable only for small-scale production with simple tools and unskilled labor. One key concept in economics is the idea of economies of scale. To achieve efficiencies and lower costs of production, output should be above a certain level. If output is too small, then labor-saving machinery and efficiencies of large-scale production are not possible. Peasants have little interest in improving productivity because they're mainly interested in feeding themselves and their families. The Chinese communists were not big on markets and producing for profits, and the peasants didn't have much of an incentive to expand production beyond their own needs. One key force in any country's transition from an agricultural to an industrial economy is an increase in agricultural productivity. Increases in agricultural output make industrialization possible in several ways. First, agricultural output is the input for industry. For instance, for a textile industry to develop, farmers need to produce cotton or wool. For a furniture industry to develop, farmers and foresters need to produce timber. For a food industry to develop, farmers need to produce wheat for bakeries. Second, as farms become more productive and need less labor, the excess labor can move to the cities to become workers in industry. Societies modernize by moving people off the farm and into the cities. Before the Second World War, more than 20% of the American labor force was on the farm. Today, it is less than 2%. And American farmers produce more output with 2% of the labor force than they did with 20% of the labor force 100 years ago. Because I've always taught at big city universities, I emphasize to my students that modern American agriculture is possibly the most high-tech sector in the U.S. economy. The typical American farmer today has a bachelor's degree in plant biology or animal genetics and an MBA in agricultural economics. American farmers use genetically created seeds, satellite moisture calculation, and sophisticated computer trading software. And finally, farmers must produce enough food not only to feed themselves, but also a growing urban and industrial labor force. The small plots created by Mao's land redistribution program for the Chinese peasants did not permit or create the incentives for increased output. 
And without increased output, the country would find it next to impossible to industrialize. But industrialization is what Mao wanted for his country. Mao's initial ideas about industrialization came from the leadership of the Soviet Union. Because he had been trained in the Soviet Union and seen some of the initial Soviet successes in building the foundations of an industrial economy, he wanted to adopt the same concepts for China. In 1953, Mao introduced the first five-year plan for China. It was a faithful copy of the Soviet approach to economic development and contained all the basic components of the initial Soviet five-year plans. These components included the nationalization of all large enterprises and the elimination of most private property. Chinese communism would not have an initial phase of some private property like the Soviet Union did during its New Economic Policy, NEP, period from 1921 to 1928. Instead, China's state-owned enterprises would be directed by a central plan devised in the capital city of Peking. The basic plan would set output targets for a five-year period. The plan would be broken down into monthly increments with output targets set in physical terms. As the Soviets had, enterprise managers would be rewarded for meeting the targets and punished for failure. But the process of constructing a national comprehensive economic plan for a country as large as China was extremely difficult. The key problem that Mao and the economic planners faced was low productivity in Chinese agriculture. China during the 1950s was almost entirely rural and agricultural, so it was incumbent on the Chinese planners to raise agricultural productivity. But most Chinese farms were too small. Land re redistribution had created hundreds of millions of very small farms. These plots were too small to use even basic farm machinery, such as simple tractors. They were also unsuited to take advantage of fertilizers, as peasant farmers were used to using the manure produced by farm animals as their primary fertilizer. Again, following the Soviets, Mao initiated a process of collectivization to force farmers into large cooperative or state-owned farms. These collectives were required to sell most of their output to state agencies at very low prices. The state agencies, mostly under the direction of the Ministry of Agriculture, would then sell the farm products at considerably higher retail prices. This price differential was one of the key sources of finance that the state could use to purchase machinery and begin the process of industrialization. The collective farms were theoretically owned by all of the farm workers. They would share whatever income was earned by the sale of the products to the state procurement agencies. Their share of the income would be determined by their hours of work and the level of skill of the work they did. In theory, this would be determined by the votes of the collective farmers. But in fact, all key decisions of the collective farm were determined by the farm manager, who was appointed by the Central Ministry of Agriculture. State farms were somewhat different in that they were organized to resemble factories and cities. Farmers were treated as laborers and paid an hourly wage. Typically, state farms tended to be much larger than collective farms and produced more important products for the planned economy. Rice production was usually a crop of state farms. Rice was important both economically and symbolically. Rice was important as a primary source of calories and energy for urban factory workers. One of the fundamental promises of Chinese communism was called the Iron Rice Bowl. What this meant was that every Chinese citizen was guaranteed a minimum diet of rice. No more starvation, as in the times of the um emperors, landlords, and foreign occupiers. Even so, the farm workers on the collectives and state farms earned meager incomes and would have had a hard time feeding themselves and their families, 
if it wasn't for the tiny plots of land where they were allowed to grow their own food. The Soviet Union's agricultural system also relied on private plots to supplement the income of the collective and state farm workers. For most Chinese farmers, the family plot was their chief source of food. They were also able, at times, to sell a small amount of their surplus produce in local markets. This gave them some money with which to buy clothes or simple household items if those items were available. At the end of the first five-year plan in 1958, Mao was disillusioned with the results. The growth of Chinese industry was slow and did not replicate the rapid industrial development that the Soviet Union had achieved in the 1930s. So Mao decided to break with the Soviet Union model. Instead, he decided to launch what became known as the Great Leap Forward. Fond of grandiose slogans and dramatic gestures, Mao thought that such exhortations could drive the Chinese farmer and worker to new heights of economic achievement. Mao thought that relying on material incentives and gradual economic progress should be replaced with an attempt to create a new socialist man. This new socialist man would be infused with the spirit of altruism, patriotism, and social consciousness. The new man would work for the glory of China and the greater good of the entire country. Selflessness would replace a desire for individual gain, and good intentions would provide the main motivation for economic progress. As part of this great leap forward, all Chinese, including farmers and rural inhabitants, would participate in the drive to rapidly industrialize the Chinese economy. So now, Mao ordered the creation of much larger collective farms that would each consist of at least 5,000 households. These large collective enterprises would also build backyard factories that would produce iron and steel and cement in the countryside. To put it bluntly, this policy was a disaster. And disaster might be too mild a word. The Great Leap Forward caused agricultural production to decline, and much of the output of the backyard factories was unusable. The decline in agricultural production led to widespread famine. The death estimates caused by such privation ranges as high as 20 million Chinese. The catastrophic failure of Mao's Great Leap Forward caused him a great loss of prestige and criticism inside the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party. As in the Soviet Union, there was no democratic process to remove leaders whose policies were failures. The leadership conflicts and struggles were carried out by bureaucratic intrigues and jockeying for key positions in the party hierarchy. But now Mao was in danger of being forced out of his leading position, and losers in bureaucratic struggles in a one-party communist state might lose almost everything. In a communist system, every part of a leader's standard of living is tied to his or her position. If forced out, the leader loses influence and access to privileged housing, medical care, food, travel, and education for their children. This is why leadership fights in one-party communist systems are so serious and hard fought. Losing really means losing, a lot. Mao, to protect his leadership position and to fight his enemies within the Chinese Communist Party, now launched the great proletarian cultural revolution of 1966. And the cultural revolution that Mao launched was not just an attack on leading cadres within the Chinese Communist Party, but also an attack on all elites. Mao encouraged Chinese youths to attack their professors. He urged urban workers to attack their bosses and ordinary citizens to attack intellectuals, artists, writers, and other leading cultural icons. Elite knowledge, science, philosophy, and literature were all denigrated. All that was needed was a knowledge of Mao Zedong's thought, 
And this could be found in a little red book that contained Mao's most important sayings. This little red book of Mao's quotations was not only idolized by Chinese youth, but even by some young students in the West. Campuses from Berkeley to Oxford to Paris would see crowds of bourgeois middle-class students waving their little red books of Maoist revolution. I was a student during these times, and even though there was a certain romantic attraction in following a third world revolutionary, Mao's quotations seemed simple-minded to me. Much later, as a professor, I understand even better the attraction of the little red book for some students. How much easier to do away with studying all kinds of books and literature and science, and instead just memorize one book of sayings as the sum of all necessary knowledge. One of the more understandable attractions of Chairman Mao and his Little Red Book during the late 1960s was realized in the support that the People's Republic of China was giving to the Vietnamese resistance to the American War in Indochina. Broadly, there was massive opposition to the American War in Vietnam, and not only in the United States, but also in Europe. And since Mao was providing some aid to the Northern Vietnamese campaign in the South, he enjoyed something of a halo effect among all those opposed to the American military presence in Vietnam. Yet many Chinese people suffered from the Cultural Revolution. Writers, scientists, intellectuals, teachers. Anyone who used their brains in their work were likely to suffer persecution and, and worse. Intellectuals and the educated were often sent into the countryside for re-education at the hands of the rural peasants. This re-education often took the form of physical torture, starvation, and even death. And the effect of the Cultural Revolution on the Chinese economy was disastrous. Economic output fell steadily from 1966 to 1970. Significant Chinese resources of human capital and brain power were wasted and destroyed. From Mao's personal perspective, the Cultural Revolution was a success. It sidelined or eliminated most of his opposition within the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party. He was able to maintain his position with no more significant challenges until his death in 1976. But the cost to the Chinese of Mao's bureaucratic victory was a decade of lost potential and reduced standards of living. At the time of Mao's death, most Chinese did not live significantly better than they had at the time of the revolution in 1949. Immediately after Mao's passing, a new leadership struggle broke out in the top ranks of the Chinese Communist Party. There were two basic factions. One side contained those who wanted to continue Mao's policies. This faction included Mao's widow, John Xing, the madam, who wanted to retain the perks of leadership that she had enjoyed as Mao's wife. This faction was labeled the Gang of Four. However, the victorious faction, led by Deng Xiaoping, advocated significant reforms in the Chinese economy. These reforms included using material incentives to encourage productive work, permitting some private ownership in decision-making, especially in agriculture, an openness to foreign trade and investment, and a decentralization of de decision-making with much less emphasis on central planning. Madame Mao's faction labeled Deng's movement the capitalist rotors. Calling someone a rotor was not a compliment, as it implied that you were trying to lead people down the wrong road. And a capitalist rotor was doubly bad because every good communist knew that capitalism was evil. But the reforms that Deng introduced, starting in 1979, would have profound consequences for China, the United States, and the rest of the world.